Um, so again, welcome to Doug. Uh, thank you for joining us here at another one of our HPCL talks. This week I'm giving it, so hopefully it's exciting and my aim is to give people a little bit of a taste of some of the technology which is coming out. The last tw 12 to 24 months I think in high performance computing has been really exciting and I think the next 24 months is going to be really, really super exciting. Uh, and so I want to give everyone uh, a little bit of an idea of what that's about, what's coming, what's gone on which you may not have known about and then what's coming in the future. So what's hot, what's not. Uh, a little bit about Doug, as some of you may or may not know us. Um, we are a technology company and we sell high performance computing as a service. If you want to use supercomputers, um, come and grab us. There's more data there if you want it. Um, again, I'm Stuart. I'm the CIO here at Doug. Um, my background is um, computational quantum physics. So I, I used to be able to solve Schrodinger's equation and things like that, but I have now spent the last 25 years in high performance computing as everything from someone who wrote scientific codes to where I am now where I, I get to wander around and throw my arms in the air and talk about lots of different things. Um, you can get me online if you want. So let's get into it. What is high performance computing? Lots of people, I think, have a, a bit of a misconception about high performance computing. So let's, let's think about it. What are some of the words people use? Well, Cray is an obvious one. Um, Cray, over the last 40 years, I guess, has been synonymous with high performance computing and supercomputers. Uh, SGI is, is right alongside there with Cray. Uh, SGI was a very early company to get into the supercomputer industry and build machines. In the news lately, there's been this wonderful machine in Japan called Fugaku. Uh, which is currently the world's fastest computer. Um, again, supercomputer, you'd, people you'll hear talk about clusters. Clusters are, is a word that's used everywhere, um, meaning from groups of people to supercomputers. Um, so I, I don't like that one too much, but people think about fast CPUs or lots of GPUs, high performance networks, high speed IO, so file IO. Um, actually, uh, uh, people who've been around the high performance computing industry actually start to think of it as just fancy cooling systems. As a physicist, what does a CPU do? A CPU takes an enormous amount of energy and converts it to heat. And then you have to get the heat out of the room. Right? So really fancy cooling systems. Um, we start talking about fancy protocols. So we talk about fancy networks, InfiniBand, RDMA, RDMA over converged Ethernet, OmniPath architecture and all these sorts of things. To other people, it's just computers that crash more. One of the features of scale, as you get bigger, there are more parts to fail. So in a supercomputer, there is generally always bits that are dead and need repair. And so it's all of that infrastructure to handle that situation. Imagine your computer at home crashes once a year. If you have 365 computers, they crash one, you get one crashing a day. If you have 40,000 computers, they're crashing all the time. So computers that crash more. You can jump online, top500.org, start seeing some of these machines that are built. Um, Frontier and Aurora are some of the leading contenders to be the first exascale computers, which is going to be this year sometime, maybe early next year. And over here is the um, Cray machine that most people associate with supercomputers because it was a couch with bucket loads of cables inside. And it's in a C shape, and this is where fancy cooling system comes in. This was way, way, way back late um, 70s, early 80s. They built it in a C shape basically to minimise cable distances and to be able to pack boards in at a higher density than you could have done before. So again, you know, a lot of engineering ingenuity went into those early machines and that carries through to today. Um, high performance computing is the Formula One of the IT industry. It's where all the cool cats hang out, Seymour Cray uh, and myself. Um, and a whole plethora of other people. But really, they're systems that are designed and built to overcome a specific problem. You don't see Formula One cars on the road during the school trip. Right? They're there as a design engine to develop technology and test technology and push it to its absolute limits. And that's a little bit why supercomputers are all about. Okay, You usually have a problem you have to solve. Lack of resources, you, your problem, your mathematical problem is so big you just need more compute. Or you're trying to solve a cooling problem. You've made this CPU that's so hot, how do you get the energy off it and out? Um, and then obviously scale. 
Another feature which I think is important really in this space is more often than not, your hardware and your software have to function as one. And that's really important. You talk about MPI, you talk about having to do these huge calculations and needing lots of network transport, transfer speeds between compute nodes. And that's to push the data backwards and forwards. So again, your software has to know how to do that. And there's lots of technology in this sort of space. So as I said, it's exciting times. Um, last week, in, uh, AMD announced their latest edition of the uh, Epic series, the Milan CPU, which you will hopefully have seen some press about. Um, they're quite an amazing machine, and, and AMD right now, if you don't know, is really taking the fight up to Intel, who's sort of been the stalwart um, in the industry for the last decade. Um, this last happened in about 2002, 2004 time zone uh, with the AMD Opteron. And it, AMD actually leapfrogged Intel, and it took Intel probably six or seven years to respond and, and claw their way back in. And so it's just happened again in the mainstream space. So that's really interesting. Um, everybody's doing GPUs. I will show you some of the technology that are coming out. FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, have started to move into the mainstream. And there's been two big drivers for this technology we'll talk a little bit about. For the first time, External networks are faster than internal networks. You can get 400 gig Ethernet. There's no PCI yet that can really drive it. So you literally cannot get a 400 gig card and plug it into a computer. But you can get switches and connect them up at 400 gig. So for the first time, our external networks are actually faster than our internal network. Another network, um, OPA, which came from Intel, um, died in the last sort of 20, 12 months. Uh, it's sort of risen again, talk about that in a minute. With Fugaku, ARM exploded onto the scene. So well, there was Fugaku and there was Apple's M1 CPU. So the ARM CPU absolutely took everyone's attention in the last 12 months. It's quite amazing. All of this bizarre exotic hardware turned up, TPUs, IPUs, VPUs, NPUs, vector cards, mergers and acquisitions, but really, this is what's driving everything at the moment, this thing called Exascale. So they're wanting to build a computer which is a thousand times faster than the computers maybe five years ago. So we went through the teraflop machine, then we went through the petaflop machine, and now we're onto the exaflop. So every time we're getting a factor of a thousand faster, this milestone is expected to tick over this year, maybe late this year, early next year. So we'll start to see our first exascale machines, which is amazing. Um, two years from now, it won't be amazing. Everyone will have one. And uh, 10 years from now, they'll, they'll be talking about the, the next big thing. I don't even know what they're calling it yet. So exascale is where everything's heading. So what's the technology that's going into all this thing? I thought I'd start off with hopefully what everyone knows about, the good old CPU. This is the main brain of your laptop. It's what drives your desktop at home. Um, what's happening in this space? Well, Intel is continuing the push on with x86, so you're going to see the latest iCore architectures and all this sort of stuff. There's a new thing coming from Intel called the Sapphire Rapids. And this is actually quite sexy. It's one of these, it's an Intel CPU, but with much, much, much faster memory on die. So normally with an Intel CPU, you'll get about 200 gigabytes a second of bandwidth. Intel's going and taking that CPU, combining it with the high speed memory from GPUs and shipping that. So this thing will have much faster memory, lots of cores. We're talking you know, in the hundreds of cores type thing. Um, high bandwidth memory, so it's gonna have terabytes a second of memory bandwidth. So four or five times more memory performance than you get out of your current CPUs. Uh, AMD is pushing on with the Epic series. The Milan is the current one. There's a few more to come. Again, lots of cores, lots of memory slots, lots of memory things. Um, now, this is really exciting in my mind. Fujitsu came out with the A64FX, and this was for the Fugaku supercomputer in Japan. This is the ARM CPU that is running in your Raspberry Pi that your kids are pounding away at home with what's called a big vector unit hanging off the side. Interestingly, Fujitsu, people may or may not know this, people may or may not know Spark. So Spark was a computer architecture that died 
basically in the 90s. Fujitsu was one of the last people to make Spark. They've now recycled that technology and they now put an arm layer on top of it. So that's actually an old Spark chip running the arm architecture now with this big vector unit. They've got lots of cores and they've got this high bandwidth memory on the chip. So again, this CPU, which has come from your Raspberry Pi, come from the 80s with Apple and um, not Cambridge, what's the other university? No, Cambridge. I was thinking of Cambridge. <laughs> it wasn't Oxford. Um, built this CPU and now it's really coming to fruition. It's an amazing chip. Um, talk a little bit more about it. Of course, this is now being picked up by AWS. So AWS is now building ARM systems or ARM CPUs. They're calling it the Graviton. Graviton. Uh, you can get that on AWS if you're desperate. Apple. Apple was one of the original people who started ARM. And they've been building ARM CPUs now for a very long time. Your iPods, your iPads, your iPhones all run ARM. Probably your Apple Watch runs an ARM CPU. These are, so Apple now, in this last 12 months, has released a desktop version of the ARM CPU and they're shipping it in all their new products and laptops and better battery life and higher performance. It's quite amazing. So again, there's lots of stuff happening in this ARM, a CPU that's just appeared not out of nowhere, but it's certainly just turning up. There's this thing called RISC-V or RISC-V, which is turning up. This is an architecture that's being taken on by the Europeans. The Europeans want to get more independence from the Americans and the, everyone else and the Chinese and have their own architecture, their own fabs, and to be able to build their own systems. And they're doing it based on RISC-V. So this is quite an interesting space. It's still in development, they're still building it, but that will be coming along in the next few years. You'll start to see supercomputers built on this new CPU and the whole tool chain. So you'll get software and Linux and everything. So that's quite interesting. All right, onto the old GPU space. So um, everyone with a desktop computer has got that card that sits in it that generates lots of heat. The kids sit on it 24 hours a day playing games. Um, it pumps out heat out the back, pumps out noise into the kid's ears and makes the screen flash wildly. That's this NVIDIA GPU. NVIDIA's had this V100 for a while now. It's been sort of the Rolls Royce of the compute engine world. Um, lots of, it's fast, high bandwidth memory. It's got lots of processing power, except that it's attached through this thing, the PCI. And as I mentioned earlier, PCI is now slower than networks. So you're starting to see these sorts of cards and Tesla bought a networking company, Mellanox, exactly so they can start plugging these things straight into the network and do away with this, this slow bit into the computer. So that's an interesting space that's coming. NVIDIA also released this new thing, an A100, which is sort of like a V100, but it's got some CPUs on it. It's a little more general purpose. Um, it's still, well, here's a photo of one. They're building custom machines, what the DGX is built out of it, I think. Um, more flops than this machine, but different flops. Much more, the A100 is much more targeted at machine learning workloads. The V100 is, is targeted at sort of more traditional compute style workloads, though they are great at, um, they are good at machine learning workloads and lots of people use them for that. AMD has always been in the GPU market, but they've really recently started to take off and build GPUs for compute, as opposed to just going in PCs and laptops. The new system going in down the road at Tech Park with um, Pawsey is based on not this GPU, but AMD style GPUs. So this is your MI50 down here. More or less the same performance as the NVIDIA product, um, a different way of using it. Intel's coming out with this new GPU, and I think this is actually going to be quite sexy. They've got this whole platform they're calling XE. The top end of that's the Ponte Vecchio, which you're going to see in the Exascale machine. Um, the specs that are starting to appear for this look absolutely amazing. They look like Intel's going to build a GPU card, which is eight times faster than these machines. So it's going to be a, a big change in performance. Completely new language to use it. The AMD sort of use OpenCL and some reasonably well understood 
programming paradigms, the program, and NVIDIA's been around so long, um, their programming language, I guess, is, is reasonably well known now. But yes, yeah, so I think this is, this is something that's going to be to watch. As I said, that's going into what should be the biggest machine in the world later this year. Lots of flops, high bandwidth memory built onto the GPU card, but you still access all of these basically by this now slow PCI. Um, the idea is you offload data onto it. How do they actually work? They're basically doing small matrix operations. If you look at linear algebra, if you look at nearly every physics problem, chemistry problem, you can express it as a linear algebra problem, and you can do all linear algebra as small matrix operations. So three by three matrix vector multiplies, string them together, do maths. That's what these do. So if you can express your problem like that, you can push it onto a GPU and hopefully you've got enough bandwidth. NEC is going out on their own. They're building this thing called a vector engine. Again, still on the slow PCI, but basically this is a vector supercomputer straight out of the 80s and 90s shoved onto a GPU card. This vector machine out of the 80s and 90s, what is on this card, basically what probably would have filled this whole building. <laughs> And it's now on a card that's about this long and about this big. Um, I was talking, these things called vectors keep coming up. If I go back to these Intel CPUs that you use now, the vector length is 512 bits. AVX 512 is the standard at the moment, the top end. These things use vectors which are 16,384 bits long. Huge vector length. Think of it like a maths problem. Matrix times a vector. The vector is 256 long, eight byte numbers. This machine, what makes it special is the memory. This little card has more memory bandwidth than everything that's come before it. So lots of things have got high bandwidth memory, your V100s, your AMD GPUs. This thing's got the most. Really, really fast memory, quite impressive. All shoved onto that little card. Here's the other interesting one that I was talking about earlier, this FPGA. Here's a picture of a Xilinx one here that I conveniently stole off the internet. These things are sort of like programmable electronic circuits. You have all of these teeny weeny little modules that you, in essence, wire up yourselves as if you've got a soldering iron and put all the logic together to build up your own custom bit of circuitry. They're really, really good at just putting a signal in one end and getting a signal out the other and doing everything streaming live. They do tend to be low power for their performance. You can get insane performance out of these, but they are difficult to use. Um, what's happened recently, Xilinx, which is this card, was taken over by AMD and will now start appearing in AMD products. And Intel took out Altera, which is the other big FPGA maker. And so now you can actually buy Intel x86 CPUs with FPGAs stuck on the side. So that's pretty cool. A lot of crypto miners use FPGAs. They develop a great algorithm for mining, code it up efficiently, push it onto this machine and let it go. Um, so a lot of the crypto miners you see out there are actually running on FPGAs, but they're not this FPGA. They tend to be dirt cheap, much less resources because they don't have to do much. Similar to FPGAs are these things called DSPs, which are the digital signal processors. These have been taken up by the Chinese in their latest rounds of supercomputers. So they, the US government basically banned Intel from selling the Chinese certain hardware. So the Chinese said, oh, look at this. Here's one I prepared earlier and wheeled out this DSP based supercomputers, which they're, they're pumping through. Again, quite interesting technology a little tough to use, but immense performance if you can extract it. Now, this is where some things start getting a little bit freaky, I think. Google came out with this thing called a TPU, Tensor Processing Unit, specifically targeting machine learning. Who here has heard of machine learning? Everybody. Who here knows basically what it is? It's basically matrix vector multiplication. TPUs in one clock cycle, one tick of the clock in the card, multiply 256 by 256 matrix by a vector of length 256. So this is the guts 
of your machine learning is working on matrix vector multiply, getting those um, coefficients in the mathematical equations working and optimizing them. The TPU delivers an immense amount of performance at that one operation. A crazy amount, except it's working in reduced mathematics, reduced precision mathematics. So where your NVIDIA GPU, your Intel CPUs work in what we call double precision mathematics, that's representing a number to 15 decimal places. These things work in maybe one or two decimal places. So they allocate much less resources to the numbers, but can process them immensely fast. If you look at the flops, which is floating point operations per second, these things do about 100 teraflops. Your latest NVIDIA V100 GPU is seven. So an immense amount of performance can be extracted from these if you can deal with the reduced precision mathematics. So of course, you know, TPU is probably a uh, trade registered name. So of course now there's an IPU, which is an intelligence processing unit. Very similar. <laughs> there's a VPU, which is a vision processing unit, which is again doing lots of matrix vector multipliers. There's an NPU, which is a neural network processing unit. And there's an AI inference engine. And these things all do very similar things. They're all targeting that artificial learning, machine learning space. But yes, some interesting stuff happening in this very, not necessarily niche anymore. This is coming to everything, but completely new hardware being developed to drive it. If you can use it for your mathematics, immense amounts of performance can be had here. If you really want to get into the weird and wonderful, go and look at this thing called an EMU computer. This thing does compute completely different to every other computer on the market at the moment. Normally what you do is you have some compute sitting there doing something and you need some data. So you go and get the data and bring it to the compute. Compute, compute, go and get some data, bring it to the compute, run, run, run. No, these guys leave the data on the chip and take the compute to where the data is. So they've sort of reversed the way things work. So imagine you've got data streaming in, it lands here, it gets processed here. It doesn't, and if the task that was processing that data stream was down here, they shift the task up to this core and process the local memory. So this is what they call, they migrate, it's a thread migrating computer. Funnily enough, go and find out who's funding this system three-letter acronym organizations out of the US. There are these interesting things called ATSICs. Crypto miners are using them. These are custom bits of silicon specifically designed to do one mathematical algorithm in essence. Um, these are used heavily in the mining world. Mining data centers are enormous these days and consuming lots of our resources. So I thought I should list them. And finally, the other weird and wonderful thing coming is this thing called a quantum computer. Um, if you haven't heard about it, you should. A company in Australia recently, this is their photo, a company called Quantum Brilliance, recently, as in the last week or so, announced their first quantum CPU, in essence, diamond bits stuffed in diamond communicating with each other. Um, their aim is to put it on a GPU card and run it in your desktop computer. So sometime in the future, um, you'll be replacing your graphics card with a quantum computer and away you go. So that'll be really interesting. So that's, this space is, is heating up at the moment. It's been physics research for the last 30 years. Um, I was doing a little bit of research in this in the mid-90s, left it, and now you know, it's absolutely exploding. So watch this space. This is where some really interesting stuff is happening. The great thing about what quantum brilliance is doing is it means you'll be able to run a quantum computer in a traditional data center. You don't need to cool this thing with liquid helium. So that's, that's pretty cool. Networks. I mentioned this earlier, 400 gig ethernet is a thing. 400 gig InfiniBand is a thing. It's faster, as I said, than your PCI on a computer. Fujitsu, of course, made their own CPU and they've made their own network. Right? It's called Tofu D. So if you want to use a, a bizarre network, jump on Fugaku, run on their Tofu D network. Intel killed this thing called OmniPath, which was a competitor to InfiniBand, but they didn't quite kill it. They spun it out into its own company, 
and uh, sold it off. Most people may or may not know this. Switches these days, these things that you see around, are now basically Linux servers. So there's been this huge transformation in the switch industry, mostly driven from the high performance computing industry to make switches non-proprietary anymore, run Linux on them, control them from Linux, and let the hardware vendors just build the sexy switching plane hardware. White box switches are continuing their rise. Um, more and more places you go around the world, especially in high performance computing, you're seeing this thing called white box switches, which are generic, no name brand switches with Linux running on them. Very cool. The white box optics. So previously when you built and bought switches, you had to go and buy Mellanox's or Cisco's optics. Very expensive. The white box optics are come and they've basically destroyed the market. Um, pretty much everyone these days, including all the people in high performance computing, are now just using optics that you buy for $5 all around the place. Quantum networks, we had quantum computers, quantum networks are a thing as well. Um, they are now building quantum networks which resolve one of the issues that quantum computers create, which is quantum computers sort of break cryptography. Quantum networks give it back to you. They, these provide you with uh, tamper-proof networks. Um, so quantum networks are really cool. Um, they are building them in real life and shooting uh, entangled photons out windows and into space and all sorts of stuff. So they're, they're coming. Completely different hardware, of course. Storage. Storage is another big component of high performance computers. Um, for the last little while, there's this thing called tiers. So that's where you move data from fast to slow storage. This has grown. Intel came out with a new storage system, I guess it really is, called Deos, which really builds on this tiering architecture. Basically, you write data into the storage system, it gets stored locally and pushed out to your persistent storage at a later time. A company called DDN owns Lustre now, and they've continued to build this. They're adding tiering features to Lustre, which is the main file system in supercomputers. A whole raft of new file systems have started appearing. This one called MadFS. I've tried to find information on it. No, I can't. It's interesting. I'd love to read more about it. BGFS, GeckoFS, Cumulo, Cubite, Weka, Panassas. These are all file systems and storage systems that have been around for a while. Then Intel bought out this thing called NVMe, which is sort of like a pumped up, beefed up version of the flash storage or the SSD storage in your laptop. The nice thing about this is they also built this thing called NVMe over fabric. So they were attaching this storage directly to your network in essence. It's the new fiber channel if you know about fiber channel. This is changing this space drastically. The speed of this NVMe storage is amazing and companies like Vast burst onto the scene taking advantage of that. So normally in these sorts of file systems and DAOS and the tiering is all about this, you're caching data. You take data, you write it really quickly to a cache, and then from that cache, you push it to bigger, slower storage. That's tiering. That's DAOS, that's DDN Lustre. And most of these, in essence, sort of work like that. Vast said, no, back of that. We can now write directly to the storage from the client, leave nothing in the way, shoot the data over known protocols, no caching, no synchronization, just make sure everything is fast enough that you don't notice. And so Vast, you know, don't, we're using it, we're a big user of Vast now, burst onto the scene last year and uh, is doing amazing things, delivering incredible performance. So watch this space. I think, I think all of these guys are, are worried about this and this. They're either going to transition into the way that Vast is doing things and their own flavour of it, or they're going to be gone. You know, Vast is delivering high performance storage at a price that's, you know, better than what you can do with tiering. So it's quite impressive. Go and have a look at the io500.org if you want to see the big storage systems and how fast they are. Cooling. Well, uh, immersion cooling is, continues to gain traction. If you haven't seen our immersion cooling set up, it's next door. Um, there's more companies doing immersion cooling now than there were 12 months ago. And this thing called OCP, which is the Open Compute Project, is starting to work on immersion cooling standards for OCP. So OCP is what Facebook, the, the, the way Facebook build their computers and data centers. So they're pushing a little bit into this space. Um, direct cooling, this is where you pump 
water or some fluid in over the top of the CPU. It's taking off and going mainstream. Everything's still using a lot of power though. The top 10 systems, on the, the top 10 biggest systems in the world are now using over 100 megawatts of power. Um, and that's just continuing to go up. So even though you're getting more compute in more energy efficiency, efficient packaging, power usage is still going up. So obviously green's starting to become important, which drives this immersion cooling. For example, Singapore put a moratorium on data centers. Not allowed to build any more in Singapore anymore. And they've, they've listed the, the, the impact on their environment and the energy use of data centers as the reason they've done that. So this is going to become very important. Uh, as I indicated, there are a whole heap of companies buying companies. Intel Bird Alt purchased Altera. AMD bought Xilinx. Uh, NVIDIA bought Mellanox. Mellanox bought Cumulus. NVIDIA is looking to buy ARM. So you've now got a GPU card manufacturer looking to buy a CPU. Uh, Intel spun out its network. IBM bought Red Hat and CentOS. Most supercomputers in the world run Red Hat or CentOS. So this was big news in the HPC industry. It's had big ramifications in the HPC industry because Intel's now, oh, sorry, IBM's now killed off the free version of Red Hat. So all the HPC centers are looking to what they're going to use next. HPE bought SGI and Cray. So your two venerable big supercomputer companies are now part of HP, HPE. Of course, if you go right back to one of my first slides, the Exascale systems were being built by Cray and now being obviously built by HPE. So HPE has sort of become very dominant in the HPC space with these big national labs. DDN bought Lustre from Intel, so DDN's a hardware storage company. They bought a software storage solution to stick on their hardware. So what's hot? What am I excited about? I'm really excited about Fugaku. You've got a new CPU. The CPU is actually relatively low performant. It's not as fast as your V100 GPUs, not as fast as the CPUs we run here, except that they run the high bandwidth memory. So your memory bandwidth per flop is much higher on this machine than anything else. And they're running a 400 gig network into each CPU. So their network bandwidth per CPU is amazing. So, I mean, this machine, hands down, I think, has, has taken the crown this year. The technology is absolutely incredible. It's going to be great to see where they go. Exascale's everywhere. I'm really impressed by it, the vast storage. Um, change of idea, do away with all the tiering, do away with all the normal storage stuff we've been doing for 20 years and come out with something completely new. Really exciting. A64FX, that's part of Fugaku. Fujitsu is now selling servers, not just Fugaku systems, they now just sell this in a box that you can buy. Um, so that's quite exciting. It'll be interesting to see where that goes. The XE Pontevecchio and Sapphire Rapids from Intel, I think, is going to be a great space. I think Sapphire Rapids is going to be a big shift in the CPU space. It's going to deliver amazing amounts of, it's going to deliver the memory performance in what Fugaku and the A64FX have got, but in a mainstream CPU. And Ponte Vecchio, I think, is going to be a, a, gra a GPU card, which uh, is going to go unrivaled for a little while. Insane amounts of performance. I like the architecture. I love balance. I, you know, what don't I like? And it's all about balance for me. So many CPUs are adding more memory channels. You go and look at, at an AMD system. Each chip has eight memory, you have to put eight memory dims in it to get performance. So a box, you've got to put eight memory sticks in. 16 memory sticks, sorry, for a dual socket box. The space that gets taken up just to put those memory sticks in is enormous. The cost is enormous. You know, you're now putting 16 dims in. And the bandwidth's not much more. It's not like the memory's, you know, stepping up to this high bandwidth memory, which is, you know, 10 times faster. The memory's still quite slow. So you know, that, that, that's a little frustrating. Um, adding more cores without adding bandwidth is a little frustrating. Everyone can make seven nanometer or five nanometer um, transistors. So you've got plenty of real estate on your little piece of silicon to put 
cores, but they're not giving any more memory bandwidth. And that's where I think Ponte Vecchio and Sapphire Rapids and A64FX tackle things. The memory in these things is you know, an order of magnitude faster than the memory you get on your normal CPU. So these things can sustain more cores, can actually drive the flops that are there. I, I'm a little frustrated too by people going and adding more and more GPUs to the same network pipe. You know, you go and put eight GPUs in a system, but you still only got one network pipe in. You know, you're still sitting on PCI. And yes, the GPU vendors are building, in essence, their own networks between the GPUs in a node, but you're still limited by having to shuffle data in and out of the CPU. So that's why we're starting to see GPU cards have their own network ports directly to the GPU. So you know, there's more happening here, but you know, lots and lots of GPUs in a box, I, I think, is um, not the way to go. What to watch? Well, Ethernet. You know, Fugaku has got TofuD. We've got, still got InfiniBand. Ethernet just slowly marches on, slowly takes over everything. We're building, inside Doug, we're building networks in Ethernet, which before you had to go to exotic networks to do. Now you can do it in Ethernet. You can now get the super low latencies in Ethernet that you could only get in exotic networks. And you know what? I think Intel is going to have a cracker. Not, not this year, maybe. I think towards the end of this year, when Ponte Vecchio comes out, Sapphire Rapids comes out, I think they're going to step over everyone um, in performance again. So I think that you know, late this year, early next year, into, into next year, they'll get their exosile system out based on Sapphire Rapids and Ponte Vecchio. They'll start becoming available to all of us. Um, and I think they're going to have, they're going to, reclaim the crown probably in mid to late next year. So I think they're going to have a great year. Um, that's all. Sorry it was a bit quick. I need a beer. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's where I think things are going. I, I, I really am impressed by what Intel is doing with Ponte Vecchio and Sapphire Rapids. Um, again, changing things. Um, High bandwidth memory, getting a better balance of system. I, I, I'm, I'm super excited by what's going to come out of there. I am super excited by, by ARM too. You know, literally, I jumped on Fugaku. I've run some code on it. I built it on my um, Raspberry Pi at home. I now I can build it on my Mac M1 and just ship it over there and run it. And you, you know, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool that you can take a $40 CPU and build your code on it and ship it over and run it on the world's fastest machine. So. Um, that, that, I, I quite like that. That's nice. Any questions? As I said, you're welcome to hang around, um, talk amongst ourselves, talk amongst Doug people. If you haven't had a tour of our immersion cooling, grab one of us, Mark, someone. Um, we can have a look around. But thanks for coming. And I uh, hope we'll see you next HPC hour. And if anyone has any questions, fire away. Stunned silence. Well, I'll take that as a, everyone wants a beer. So join us in the kitchen. Yep, Toby. Yeah, okay, so what's Doug interested in? So you've got ARM, you've got Intel. Where are you guys going? Um, I, I mean, I'm really keen on, on this, on the Intel products. Um, I'm, I'm not so keen, actually, on their standard x86 products. I, I mean, they're great chips. Intel, makes fan, Intel and AMD make great hardware, but that adding more memory dims to me it just looks like they've run out of ideas to solve the fundamental problem of not enough bandwidth. Um, the fact that you have to put so many, you know, 16 DIMMs in a computer, you know, that takes up so much real estate on your board, you know, and you've got to get air and fluids moving around that to cool it and all that sort of stuff. It just doesn't seem right. Putting this high bandwidth memory, putting it as close as possible to your CPU, to me, seems like the right idea. So that's got, oh, I really like that. I like it in the GPU cards, but this brings it out of the GPU cards and makes it available. So yeah, I mean, I'm keen on this. It's not out yet. Um, so where's Doug going? It, for us, really, it's going to be what our customers want. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to track all the technologies. We're going to follow them all. Uh, as I said, to me, these are exciting. But ultimately, we're driven by what our customers want. Um, so that's, that's, that's a big driver for us. We have people who want all of it. And um, so you know, there'll probably be a bit of everything. So uh, all of these systems um, can be called in the same way you're doing the machines here? Yes. We have, I haven't put an, I have put an ARM CPU in, but not this one. 
I, I run a demo for schools where I take along a Raspberry Pi and dunk it in fluid. Um, all of these, all of these cards, not, not this one, because that's not out yet, but all the rest we have in fluid already. Um, we, have, we, don't have in, we don't have the Sapphire Rapids yet, but the rest we do. So yeah, they can all be cooled um, with immersion cooling, no problems at all. I haven't put an M1 in yet. Soon. When I buy my next one. I've got one at home. Uh, so it's, it's a candidate for going into fluid shortly. <laughs> so what's the resistance to, because you save quite a bit on power, right, with air conditioning, with this immersive yep. cooling. So what's the resistance to its broader uptake? Um, probably people not understanding it is the biggest resistance. They, they, most people focus on the change that has to come about in their data center and, and change is hard. You know, you go from things which are this way to now you're lying on the ground and like literally to put them in your data center, it's going to block corridors and it's going to do other things. So um, they don't necessarily look for solutions to these things. They just go, oh, too hard and don't do it. But I think the green aspect and the power savings are, are going to, mean that you have to. If you can't build more data centers, how are you going to get more compute in the same energy envelope? Well, you're going to go somewhere which saves you 50% of your power. So I, I think that will really drive um, the uptake of immersion cooling. And literally, I put everything in. <laughs> I put Christmas lights in, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, it all works. So. so roughly, what's the ratio of uh energy going into the compute aspect and energy going into the cooling aspect? So for us, um, we spend about 4% of our energy on cooling. In a normal data center, it's more like 40%. So it's quite yes, significant. So it's something that you can do something about, whereas the other one is you don't have much control. Mm. It, it's an interesting space, the cooling space, and the supercomputer industry has always been about cooling. You look at the early craze, there was one called Mr. Bubbles, which they built, which was immersion cooling, done in the 80s. A whole big sea thing was full of fluid. Um, they've been doing it, you know, so it's been around for a long time. Cray built some CPUs where they actually um, encased the CPU in glass, well, in essence, in glass, and sprayed fluorine I think it was fluorine. Was it flu I don't think it was fluorine in those days. But they were sp basically spraying the coolant onto the top of the CPU and evaporating it straight off the CPU. So, um, yeah, so they built this whole mechanism to spray it on. Um, I remember in the mid-90s, Fujitsu vector machines, you know, the NEC vector card, there was this, another one called Fujitsu um, that had a, a thing called a VPP300. Their CPU was about this big, enormous. But most of it was this big stainless steel case, and they actually pumped water in through all the layers of the circuitry to cool the CPU down. Uh, it was so hot. So they actually had circuit board, CPU, and everything, and cooling system all in one massive package, and they just pumped fluid in. And... So yeah, it, there's, there's always been a big cooling thing in supercomputing. Lots of energy. I mean, we're now at 100 megawatts for the top 10 systems. Uh, it's incredible. The biggest energy system is like 30 megawatts at the moment in a, in a, in a single computer. Um, Ten years ago, the most energy in a system was only two or three megawatts. So you know they're, they're putting in faster CPUs, they're putting in more energy efficient CPUs, but their energy use is going up also. So uh, it's a big thing. 